The Secret of the Orphan Crystals An Erotic Adventure The sun was just beginning to set as Tutu happily marched through Burrito Park, a delicious burrito clutched in his hand and his finest sombrero atop his head. Mamma mia, that's a nice burrito, he announced to nobody. The park was completely deserted, aside from young Tutu, who had snuck out of the orphanage after curfew. He was on one of his monthly burrito missions, and he was but a few burrito bites away from declaring this mission accomplished. Or so he thought. He held the burrito up to his mouth, but before he could take another bite, he was startled by a loud noise which emanated from up in the fucking sky. Caca! Out of nowhere, some kind of unidentified flying creature swooped down and stole Tutu's sombrero from off his head, carrying it away with its long red and white striped claws. Tutu looked up at the creature as it flew off into the sunset, and the creature turned its head back around to look at him with its bulging white eyeballs staring down over its pointed red beak at the innocent and hatless Tutu. Tutu was so shocked by what had just occurred that he involuntarily let what remained of his beloved burrito slip from his clutches. As he watched the burrito fall towards the filthy ground, as if in slow motion, his entire catalog of burrito memories flashed before his eyeballs. He remembered a few seconds earlier when he was like, Mamma mia, that's a nice burrito. He remembered a few minutes before that when he was at the burrito store and he was like, I'll take one burrito, please. And he also remembered earlier that day he was sitting in the orphanage drawing a picture of a burrito on the wall in his room. He was so young back then. Tutu was remembering these memories in reverse order, like that movie Memento, but he didn't have time to remember any farther back into his burrito history before his fresh burrito splatted onto the ground before him, and the sombrero stealer had already gotten away, leaving him cold, alone, and hungry. For a second, he considered picking up the burrito and eating it anyways, but then he recalled the wise words of wisdom he had learned long ago from the mouth of his dearly departed Gramps Pa. If the food falls on the floor, you cannot eat it anymore. Because the floor is goddamn filthy. Now finish your vegetables and clean that floor, you Stupid one-eyed baby. That was his Gramps Pa's epitaph. He had it printed on an extra wide tombstone after that fateful night when he got drunk and fell onto a tree branch and died. Just then, something else occurred to Tutu. In addition to the great deal of emotional pain he was in right now after experiencing this simultaneous loss of his burrito and his sombrero, he was also in a significant amount of physical pain. He soon realized that at some point during all the course of the remembering he had just been doing, he had also managed to fall onto a tree branch. Oh, my fucking leg! The branch was impaled through his left leg, leaving him unable to walk. He shouted for help, but there was nobody around to hear him. He looked around for something that could help him out of this predicament, but all he saw was a large sign posted on the only tree in the park which read, CAUTION! Watch out for fallen tree branches. Tutu felt like he was gonna cry from all this pain. Fortunately, earlier that day he had charged his tear shields to their full capacity. Maybe some part of him knew that he was gonna need them. He sat there bleeding out of his leg for what felt like hours, but had in fact only been a few minutes. The sun hadn't even finished setting yet. He felt something licking his leg wound and became paralyzed with fear. 
He didn't want to look down, afraid that perhaps that red-beaked, sombrero-stealing creature had come back to terrorize him some more. He breathed a sigh of relief when it turned out that the thing that was licking him was not a scary monster. It was just a cute little puppy dog. But his relief was short-lived, for when he looked closer at the dog and noticed the burrito juices smeared around its mouth, his relief turned into concern. The dog had eaten Tutu's fallen burrito off the ground, but that was not what concerned him. What concerned him was that the dog was also licking his open bloody leg wound, thereby infecting his innocent bloodstream with a deadly combination of canine DNA and burrito DNA. It was very scientific. Tutu knew what this meant. It was only a matter of time before the sun finished setting and the moon took its rightful position up in the fucking sky. And when that happens, the moon is going to release its moon spores, which are also known as mini moon balls, as it does every night. And if the newly infected Tutu happens to still be outside when that happens, he is going to absorb those moon spores into his human skin, transforming him into a ferocious burrito wolf. Tutu had to get out of there fast, but how was he supposed to do that? He couldn't walk, and there was nobody around except for this piece of shit dog who just infected him. He knew the dog didn't mean to do it, but still... What a little piece of shit. Hey, go get me some help, dog, he said. The dog didn't go get help, though. Instead, it just laid down and fell asleep. Tutu was getting tired himself. Maybe there's no way out of this, he thought. Maybe I should just sleep here and accept that my ultimate fate is to transform into a burrito wolf. Hey, if, if Michael J. Fox can do it... So can Tutu J. Fox. The sun had finally disappeared over the horizon and Tutu's eyelids were getting heavy as he prepared to drift off to sleep, perhaps for the last time, at least in human form. But then he heard a familiar voice ringing out from up in the treetop. Oh, oh, oh. Candace Claus jumped down from atop the only tree in Burrito Park, landing on the ground next to Tutu and his canine companion. Tutu was happy to see his friend and confidant. Now that she was here, he was sure to be saved. The dog was notably less happy to see her. For some reason, as soon as it laid eyes on Candace Laws, it immediately ran the fuck out of the park as fast as its little dog legs would take it, without so much as a thanks for the burrito, sir. You gotta help me, Candace Laws! cried Tutu, not wasting any time with small talk for fear that he could transform at any second. I've fallen and I can't get up. He knew this line was a reference to something, but he didn't know what it was. Candice Law's facial expression barely changed, but Tutu could tell that she was worried about him by the way she said her famous catchphrase, Oh, oh, oh. She often used this simple three-syllable phrase to hide her true emotions. But as she stared into her friend's infected bleeding wound, she knew this situation would require her to temporarily expand her vocabulary. She reached out a sharp, slender hand towards Tutu and said to him, Come with me if you want to live. And unlike that last reference, this quote was one that Tutu did recognize. It was a fucking Terminator. Tutu grabbed her hand and she pulled him up off the ground, removing the tree branch from his leg in the process. Blood sprayed out of his leg, some of it splattering on Candace Law's face. He apologized for getting blood on her, but she said nothing as she slowly licked the blood off her cheeks with her long purple tongue. Leaning on his friend for support, Tutu began to limp his way out of Burrito Park, but he wasn't safe yet. Here comes the moon, he said as he watched the moon begin to rise up into the sky. There was less than an hour before the moon would begin its cycle of releasing its moon spores, and Tutu did not know how they were gonna get out of this one. How are we gonna get out of this one? He asked Candace Laws. She thought for a second and then replied, 
Oh, oh, oh. They exited through the gates of Burrito Park and slowly made their way down the eerily empty streets towards the orphanage. After a few minutes of walking, they stopped so that Tutu could catch his breath. He must have been holding Candice Law's hand much tighter than I thought, as he noticed he now had cuts all over his fingers. Candice Laws inspected his leg wound closely. The bleeding had stopped, but now it was beginning to turn green, and she dabbed at it with her thick blue tongue. Tutu assumed that she knew what she was doing. After all, she had much more medical knowledge than he did. You should have seen this burrito I had earlier, he said to Candice Laws as she continued to lick at his leg wound. It was so good. It looked just like... Like that. Tutu pointed out towards the road. He could not believe what he was seeing. Right there before his very eyeball was the ghost of his fallen burrito. Tutu was mesmerized by its presence. He stood up and began to limp towards the burrito ghost. It's so beautiful, he said, a single tear leaking out from his tear shield. He reached out to grab the burrito and was blinded by a bright light which was rapidly approaching him. He heard what sounded like a car horn when Candice Laws flew into him, shoving him onto the other side of the road, and the vehicle sped by, just barely missing them. Candice Laws had saved his life once again. You have saved my life once again, Candice Laws, he redundantly said. That wasn't a burrito ghost at all. It was a burrito mirage. Oh, oh, oh. Candice Laws yelled her catchphrase at him more angrily than usual. Then she looked down and realized that when she had pushed her companion out of the way of that car, in the process of saving him, she had also dug the ends of her sharp pointed fingers into his chest. She carefully withdrew her fingers from Tutu's body. She hadn't penetrated him too deeply, but it was enough to draw blood. As the dark red blood poured out of him, it stained his light pink t-shirt. It began as eight small, individual stains, one for each of her pointed fingers. But in a matter of seconds, each of the little blood stains connected to make one big stain. The shape of the blood stain on Tutu's shirt looked oddly familiar to Candace Laws, like it was a shape that she should recognize that she should know the word to describe what it looks like, but she could not put her bloody finger on what it was. Then Tutu looked down at the stain on his own shirt, and he drowsily proclaimed, Hey, Candace Laws, that looks just like a heart. Then he died. Just kidding. <laughs> Although he had only passed out about a half an hour ago, Tutu awoke feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. It took him about a minute to notice that Candice Laws was sitting right next to him, her red and white striped tongue about an inch away from his eyeball. Thanks for saving me again, Candice Laws, but there's not much time left. We have to get inside before I transform into a burrito wolf. They were right outside of the orphanage now. Candice Laws must have carried him there while he was unconscious. But the door to the orphanage was locked and bolted. So how were they possibly gonna get inside without alerting the orphan master? Oh, 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 Candice Laws suggested as she pointed a pointy finger up towards the roof of the building. You think we can sneak inside through the roof? Tutu asked, confused as usual. Candice Laws slowly nodded her head. Tutu looked up at the moon nervously. The moon looked back at him and began to release its moon spores. Why are you doing this to me, moon face? Tutu shouted, shaking his fist at the moon. The moon didn't respond, but Tutu felt that it looked at him apologetically, as if it were saying, Sorry, Tutu, I'm just a fucking moon. Oh, oh, oh. Candice Laws yelled down to Tutu from up on the roof of the orphanage. 
Tutu wondered how she even got up there. It's not like there are any ladders around. Tutu grabbed onto the strange, squishy rope that Candace Laws had lowered for him, and she easily lifted him up as if he weighed nothing. It wasn't until he was actually standing on the roof that he realized it wasn't a rope that she had lowered. It was her giant rope-colored tongue. But there would be time to think about how gross that is later. Those moon spores are closing in fast. So is there like a secret door up here or what? Tutu asked, hoping that his friend wasn't going to suggest what he thought she was. She said nothing, so he knew what he was going to have to do. He would have to climb into the orphanage through the only opening there was. The chimney. I don't know about this, Candace Laws. Isn't there some other way? He really didn't want to enter that fucking chimney. But Candace Laws leaned in close to him and softly said, Oh, oh, no. She shoved him into the chimney. He looked up at her as he fell and saw the large swarm of moon spores surrounding her. Candace Laws! That chimney was much longer than he expected. When he landed in the fireplace below, he looked up, but it was too dark to see anything. Tutu held his hand up to the heart-shaped blood stain on his shirt and sighed. Thank you, Candace Laws, wherever you are. Suddenly, a deep, booming voice shouted in the darkness, Who the fuck is in my fireplace? There were many theories as to why the only fireplace in the orphanage was located in the orphan master's personal bedroom. Some say he used it to burn the bones of the orphans who broke the rules of the orphanage. Some say that in the winter times he'd light a fire and jerk off to the burning firewood. And some even say that he used the fireplace to keep himself warm. But one thing was for certain. He loved that goddamn fireplace. It was pitch black in the orphan master's room, so he hadn't seen Tutu yet. Tutu decided that he would attempt to sneak out, but he took one step and fell onto the floor because of his broken, infected leg. Uh, by the way, he also broke the leg when he landed in the fireplace. The fat fucking orphan master switched on his bedside lamp and stumbled out of bed. He stood over Tutu, breathing heavily, staring directly at him, staring into his soul. Tutu had never seen the orphan master not wearing his dark sunglasses before. If he had, he surely would have noticed just how beautiful his eyeballs were. They didn't look like regular eyeballs, they looked like they were made of an entirely different eyeball material. The light sparkled off of the orphan master's eyes as he stood there and sniffed the air. I know you're in here, he growled. You smell like burritos and blood. He picked up a long thin stick and started waving it around the room until it hit Tutu in the side of the head. There you are! Tutu wanted to run, but he couldn't move. This fat fuck with his sparkly eyeballs was probably going to eat him or something. He looked around for some kind of weapon that he could use to defend himself. He grabbed a book off of a nearby shelf to throw at the orphan master. But this book was no ordinary book, Tutu observed. It wasn't written in any human language. Instead of words, each page was covered in a series of tiny bumps. Tutu had no idea what it meant. But he threw the strange book right at the orphan master, hitting him in the fucking face. This guy has pretty bad reflexes, thought Tutu. I'm directly in front of him and he made no attempt to dodge my attack. It's like he didn't even see it coming. The orphan master beat Tutu over and over with his stick, shattering Tutu's tear shield. But he didn't need that right now anyway. He was too afraid to shed any tears. Eventually, the orphan master stopped hitting him and threw his stick to the floor. I think you've had enough, he said. That's when the lights went out. Tutu heard some strange noises in the darkness, scratching and crunching and squishing. What the fuck is this crazy orphan master doing, he thought. And then, after a minute, 
the noise is stopped. Oh, oh, oh. When the room lit back up, the orphan master was nowhere to be found. Everything in the room had been painted red, and before Tutu stood his trusted companion, the one true Candace Laws. She was now wearing a sombrero for some reason, and in each of her hands she held a small, round, eyeball-sized crystal. She absorbed the crystal balls into her skin, and Tutu watched the crystals as they traveled up each of her arms into her head, and her eyeballs transformed into crystals. Two thick beams of light shot out of her beautiful crystal eyes, one red and one white, and when the beams hit Tutu, all of his wounds were healed. Now that he was able to walk again, Tutu approached Candace Laws and hugged her. She closed her eyes and the pair rocketed into the air, crashing through the roof of the orphanage, soaring over Burrito Park, scattering moon spores all over the fucking sky. That burrito eating dog from earlier watched them fly away and he was like, now I've seen everything. Be be because it was a talking dog. It was a talking dog the whole time! <laughs>